The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the interest uh, in our uh, today's webinar and today's speaker. Uh, before uh, we begin, I would like to remind you remind you a few rules. Uh, so you will be muted during all all the webinar, and if you have any questions, please type them in the question chat. Uh, uh, one, once uh, the webinar is I mean, once the presentation is finished, uh, we'll uh, read the questions and uh, our today's speaker uh, will will answer to them. Uh, also, I would like to remind you that uh, if you if you would like to know more about ChemSpace and uh, would like to know more about webinars that we will be will be will be hosting in the future, please uh, uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, Facebook or Instagram. Uh, with that, uh, just a few technical questions. Uh, could you please type in in the questions or chat boxes uh, whether you can hear me and uh, see my screen? I, yeah, we can actually. Okay. Already. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, before uh, before the actual you know presentation, I would like to show you just a few slides about ChemSpace to remind you who we are and what we're doing. Uh, uh, so uh, our mission uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a as a company, as a platform, uh, to present a single place for ordering compounds. We offer uh, the access to the platform through web through campspace.com, uh, through API integration with the client application and uh, through integration with uh, ERP system of the company. Uh, by, by doing all this, you will access uh, uh, over 330,000 in-stock building blocks and reagents provided by 30 preferred and uh, well-renowned uh, world renowned suppliers. Uh, 5.8 million in stock screening compounds and uh, billions and tens of billions of make on demand analogs to these in stock compounds. Uh, probably the easiest way to access ChemSpace is go to web at chemspace.com and uh, if you want to search uh, the compounds, you can uh, you have uh, different options. For example, this classical search where you do exact match, substructure search, and similarity search. And by the way, we've just updated uh, this uh, window to make it more useful, useful and use, use, usable for you. So you can search either in building blocks and intermediates, and screen compounds. And if you prefer uh, to see the in-stock items, you just can uh, do the, this, the checkbox here and see the only the in-stock items from ChemSpace. And you can see that when you're doing this, you are actually accessing a one over 1.6 billion small molecules. Uh, you can also do text search by just uh, typing the name, uh, ID, ChemSpace ID, or smiles, or you can import SD or text files. Uh, those are just a few words about the kind of the conventional, the typical way to search uh, for chemical, uh, for, for small molecules. There is another uh, way to search for the molecules uh, and it's actually powered by uh, F3s uh, provided by Biosol IT. And this is something that allows you, this is, this, this is the tool that allows you to search uh, in uh, the fragment space uh, of the, of the uh, compounds that are not in stock, but can be uh, delivered with a high success rate. And they, we call these compounds real space. So uh, this, this option is uh, available thanks to uh, Biosol IT and their uh, terrific tool that uh, allows to search in the, in the billions and tens of billions, maybe trillions of, uh, of the molecules. And today, uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, our uh, speaker, Dr. Markus Gastreich from, from Biosol IT. He is Senior Director, uh, Application Science there. Uh, 
Just a few words about Marcus. He received his, from his PhD uh, from uh, University of Bonn. Uh, then he uh, was an application scientist uh, at Biosol IT. And uh, since 2013, he is a director of, of uh, application science uh, at the company. Today, uh, he will be presenting a chemical space docking, uh, where he basically will, will show how to mine uh, billions of, of make on demand molecules in 3D. Uh, with that, uh, Marcus, I would like to give you the, uh, uh, the, the possibility to present. Uh, okay. okay, brilliant. So that looks good. Just a second. So I know what screen to show. And here you go. So you can hear and see me and see my screen. Is that correct, Yuri? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So good evening from Germany, everybody. Thank you, Yuri, for the very kind introduction, for the invitation to, um, to jump in and um, be able to present a little bit of what we do in the framework of chemical spaces. <clears throat> so I go into presentation mode right here. There we go. And um, I wanted to take a very small detour with that uh, with the first few slides because we had this super impressive meeting uh, last week that had been organized by the NIH um, by Mark Niklaus and his team and um, I captured a few things where I thought it would be worthwhile to just chat about these for a few slides before we dive into the uh, into the docking etc so introduction uh, I noticed that many people actually used synonymously the words libraries, spaces, databases, etc., etc. And um, I thought that perhaps it should be made clear that when we talk about libraries, usually we refer to libraries as enumerated collections of molecules. So what does enumerate mean? Enumerate essentially for the information scientists means that you would touch every instance, every molecule of a database. For example, if you have a huge SD file and you process this in an enumerated way, then that means that the computer sees every little molecule um, once at least. Be it on creation, be it on conformat generation, be it on docking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how do you collect these, or how do you create these? Well, you can simply do the the, the collection, or <laughs> with the obvious thing, just collect more and more and more, like you collect stamps. Um, but also, there are various other methods that have emerged. So, for example, using um, generative models in AI. Um, and I have given always one or two pointers here to people who are very prominent in that respective field. Or you have certain algorithms, I put this in square, uh, in the in, in quotation marks here, notably those that Jean-Louis Raymond's group in Bern in Switzerland have created. So there they do rule-based enumeration for, right, for example, they have done. They are now also augmenting this with uh, AI methods and so on and so forth. What you could also do is um, think about potential reactions that uh, compounds may undergo and you shred them into pieces and just collect um, many small pieces, reassemble them and so on and so forth. So there are various possibilities how you would arrive at a whole bunch of, of, of molecules. Currently, I would say up to 10 to the 11th molecules and with an enormous effort, probably also up to the 10 to the 12th, but I haven't seen until today anything larger. The larger spaces, however, they can be created if you do combinatorial. So you can combinatorially assemble uh, fragments into new mo novel molecules in the computer. And you can create these spaces by, for example, actually projecting forward reactions that have worked in the past, applied to synthesis and building blocks um, that have also worked in, in other reactions, for example, or in that respective reaction, but you do different combinations. So essentially you do combinatorial combination with uh, synthons or building blocks that you have. Um, we use these te techniques prominently, especially in collaboration with Enamin and Wuxi. Uh, Lily have also uh, published very nicely a few papers on their proximal collection. And uh, Matthias Rareis group have previously also used uh, shredding so that you cut things into pieces and then reassemble them driven by reactions. 
obviously using these combinatorial approaches you reach up to way way uh, higher sizes larger sizes of these chemical spaces the largest to date that i have seen is 10 to the 26th um, virtual molecules by gsk but i have a little bit more details there so having um, made the wording that I hope I will be able to use throughout this webinar clear, um, having said this, there are two uh, flavors of the enamine real, as it's often referred to. So we have the enamine real database, which is currently in the range of 10 to the ninth molecules, so billions. And we have the enamine real space, which is an order of magnitude larger uh, currently as it is. And believe us, we are working hard with enamine to actually make the space even larger and larger and larger and larger. So that said, um, you can imagine that many, many molecules will require a lot of um, uh, computational effort, maybe even a lot of money before you can actually start. Um, so we have these large collections, e-molecules, Zinc-15, which has recently been superseded by Zinc-20 that John Irvin was talking about, at the NIH meeting last week. And uh, of course, ChemSpace um, is just another example of huge collections of enumerated library just as well. So I have uh, jotted down uh, during the workshop lots of numbers and I tried to capture, uh, capture a lot of them. Sometimes it was uh, easier, sometimes it was much harder. So I have a sparse table here of what I have recorded. If we look at the computational effort that we have here, so, um, for example, we had gratefully open eye were very open in what they presented with respect to timings, uh, hardware requirements, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you see, if we just walk through this uh, example briefly here, the generation of the smiles molecules themselves in the range of 10 to the 11th was done on 400 CPUs and took them still one and a half days. So just the pure generation, the right out of the smiles. And then you don't even have 3D yet, but you would have to generate conformers. So these conformers, um, evidently also 10 to the 10th, need storage. And storage is 20 terabytes that they needed on 29,000 CPUs, still requiring 55 hours of computation time. So this is an enormous effort. The good thing about it is Conformer generation has to be done only once if you want to go for a docking, because docking itself is uh, either a, uh, an optimization problem in torsional space, so you adjust the torsion so that the ligand fits, or in other cases, Fred, for example, you use this confirmation that you have generated once and you fit it rigidly into the pocket. But um, be it the way it is, if you have a pre conformer generation procedure, it's a one time event. Fast Rocks is a 3D superposition engine that runs uh, super fast from OpenEye. Yet, look at the numbers, 170 GPUs and still one hour of computation. Fast rocks on the real space um, costs uh, roughly, they say, $300 per screen, so one query against um, the real space, although um, that real space, I'm not so sure whether that's in the end perhaps the database because they had shown uh, lots of enumerated um, enumerated uh, chemical spaces there or enumerated collections and a giga docking 10 to the 10th they estimate this cannot currently be done uh, they are working on this but it, they estimate 100 terabytes of storage volume so an enormous amount of storage that's needed there for one giga docking and look at this figure here this is the resale price that they currently envisioning uh, a quarter million dollars um, for such a screen so this is impressive on the one hand side but um it's not it's not so green yeah it, it consumes a lot of computational power that is something that that one has to acknowledge at this point in time yeah even worse um argon um reported on their docking and scoring procedure with 10 to the 12th where they didn't really do a full docking but they they called it a docking surrogate and they needed 2.5 times 10 to the sixth node hours in total and estimate the computation cost in amortization with the supercomputer that they have. Um, it's, a, it's an analog to the uh, summit that they have. So one of the largest supercomputers currently out there, 6 million um, for, for such a gigadocking. So unbearably high um, 
an enormous amount of, of money, uh, energy, and storage that you need, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, one of the last talks was given by um, um, by people from Google, from the patents department, and they referenced to a storage only in uh, cost and uh, you know, size requirement, 100 pentabytes, and 1 million, uh, just the storing cost uh, for a year, although I admit you would never store all this data for a year, but you would just uh, store the results and then locally you would need Google for that. So all of this said, what does this mean essentially? Well, it means that we have to rethink um, how we are going to deal when the spaces get even larger and larger and larger and larger. So Henry Ford once said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And we know what happened in the end. What happened was that the car was invented and the car um, did not make the horse superfluous. We are still uh, enjoying horseback riding and we use horses in various uh, areas, but the cars have taken over for transporting on a daily basis. That said, um, how can we think about something even faster? So what's the alternative to even uh, bigger cars or even faster horses and fast horses? In other words, what can we do as an alternative for these enormous amounts of computational effort? Well, chemistry yells at us. Uh, chemistry is A plus B equals C. So there is some sort of combinatorial flavor to this. And we should be able to actually span up these chemical spaces in a different way, exploiting the combinatorics and adapting the algorithms to actually surf through them, to navigate through them. Also, on the fly while we go exploiting the combinatorics so that we can avoid enumeration, so that we can avoid touching every molecule in the computer. Uh, just uh, thus saving time and energy and computational effort there. So what is out there? Um, I have adapted this overview that we had done back in the days as a uh, as a cover art proposal. Uh, it wasn't taken for the cover art of DDT back in the days uh, in 2019 uh, when I wrote this up with Thorsten Hoffmann, uh, but it's still often used and we've seen this a few times now in this NIH meeting, for example. So I compared this to planets out there in the galaxy. So take a look. We have the Milky Way, which is roughly 10 to the ninth stars, and I have tried to scale the radii of these bubbles here of, uh, that, that allude to planets with the number or with the, with the log, the 10th log of the, um, of the exponent up here. So 10 to the 11th is um, half of the size of 10 to the 22 here, which is actually certainly not the case, but uh, I currently didn't find any, any more graspable way of drawing this up. So take a look. We have these proprietary chemical spaces that have been created by companies. Lily, um, PLC. In the DDT paper, there is a typo. I wrote uh, LPC, but it's called PLC. So, um, Lily, whoever uh, you are out there, forgive me for this typo. Böhringer Inkelheim, uh, BI claim when it was out for the first time, 10 to the 11th. Pfizer, 14. Evotech, 16. Astra, 17. Johnson Johnson, last week reported, 10 to the 19th. Merck in Germany, massive space in 2018, 10 to the 20th. And GSK XXL, 10 to the 26th. Uh, virtual molecules. So uh, these are crazy numbers. On the other hand, we have a bunch of public spaces also out there as well, notably GDB17. The GDB databases have grown much larger today. NCI Savvy from Mark Nicklaus, 10 to the 8th when it was first reported. Now he has reported on 10 to the 9th, so a few billion already, and so on and so forth. And we have those that are av available for purchasing from them, um, notably the two big on-demand chemical spaces here, Wuxi Galaxy, um, with an XI at the end to allude to the Wuxi Wuxi um, 10 to the 9th, and in, I mean, real space currently in the 10 to the 10th. That's a, that's a small time to say, uh, that's, yeah, 10 to the 11th region now with the latest version. And, um, and still so much uh, smaller than the proprietary spaces that are out there using the proprietary building blocks augmented by proprietary chemistry though. So how can we then generate these super big spaces? Well, we have this idea of a rocket, exploit the chemistry. Somebody has to sit down and do the dirty job of recording the reactions. The good news is that we have done this for 100 and I don't know how many reactions that, we, that, that are public so that we can use. 
So if you wanted to create your own space, you wouldn't have to draw this all over again because many, many um, of the reactions that you employ are likely already in our system so that we can use this. And then we have reagents that match this description here. So you see there is an L and this L is a linker and this encodes a chlorine, a bromine or an iodine connected to a carbon. And then this ring, for, uh, this uh, bond formation is created and the OH2 is removed and so on and so forth. So reagents that match this procedure will be automatically picked out using our Co Colibri tool. So this is a piece of software that we have that takes care of all this bookkeeping, etc. And we remember the um, chemical compatibility. So we, we recall in the system that a boronic acid can be coupled to an halogenated uh, aromatic system in a Suzuki coupling. So boronic acids are, get this green um, linker atom, Lego, uh, type of thingy and the um, the aromatic gets a yellow one and then we can just superimpose those two lego bricks connecting a new bond the linkers fly out and we have described a virtual molecule without actually storing everything of results but simply storing the reactions and these two building blocks if we do this multiple times we have certainly the cross effects. So not only can we generate this compound, but we can also generate the cross compounds, this one, this one, and so on and so forth with more reactions. So if we keep on going, um, we can include more reactions and thus create larger spaces. This includes also multi-component reactions. These are easy to, to handle in the end once written up the reaction. It's just analog we have not only green and yellow but now we have green and, and red and blue and this already explodes up with many many more possibilities and so on and so forth so i mentioned the bookkeeping before bookkeeping is done using colibri so all we need to do is in, uh, encode the chemical reaction know-how and the building blocks feed this into colibri as uh, two input streams and then uh, we have this tree processing that takes care of removal of duplicates. You can do um, filtering of uh, building blocks that, that are too fatty and so on and so forth. And then we have created a so-called fragment space, a chemical space, a chemical fragment space. And what we need is that so-called compatibility matrix that, that tells us who is compatible with whom. So we have seen that yellow, for example, is compatible with green and blue with yellow and so on and so forth. So this is all stored in a proprietary format that people can then use, download or create themselves. And then we are ready to go. So ready to go, what does it mean? Space navigation, how does this work? So I reused the figure that we had before with the planets in its original form as it appeared in DDT last year. Um, and I have colored this differently. So what you see here is um, where are the uh, chemical reaction driven uh, spaces and where are the collections and where are enumerated compounds that have been generated by certain algorithms. So this yellow thing uh, pops out here. It's the GDB that has been generated using enumeration in the computer. But the green ones, they are all um, reaction driven chemical spaces, notably also NCI Savage, Monk, Scooby-Doo, um, and the big ones, including the knowledge space, which is free to download from our web page there, um, have been created using this very technology that I was explaining before. So how big is really big there? Just to uh, not plot this logarithmically, but to plot this um, linearly. So you see the, uh, the version 2027, which is just, uh, you know, one version back, that, um, that is actually so much larger than everything that was considered to be large. So the real database that many people refer to as the enamine real is just a tiny fraction of what is in the real space. Um, synthesis within three weeks, that's what, what enamine aim at. And this is what we hear from customers is also more or less the case um, with 80% success rate. And what we hear is that it's often even higher. So this is a terrific success story. A little bit more concretely, how does this work when we assemble these? So I'll take you through the, uh, slowly through this graphic, never fear. We essentially navigate through a hypercube of possibilities, a hypercube that spans up the chemical space possibilities here. And if we assume that we started down here at the edge of this graph here, then we have on these axes various uh, building blocks associated to uh, to the respective reactions. So if we started here, for example, 
the first access read, use these A mines. So we walk up here and we use this A mine here. And then on access number two, to react with these assets to form an A mine. Okay, so if we take this A mine and we take this um, asset here, we can certainly connect the bond right here and form this A mine bond here. If we do this now in a third dimension, and for the ease of explanation, I start here with this result because then I have an easier way going this axis. So if we have this amide here, for example, we can then take the third axis and couple this amide to these cyclic, oops, excuse me, and couple these uh, amides to these cyclic systems. So here we have one. We can, uh, we can connect here, you see the R group, which is our linker that contains the reaction possibilities in, in, in its uh, information. We can connect this linker here with this product to actually then form this product and so on and so forth. So thus we are building up a huge um, multi-dimensional tree of, uh, sorry, cube of possibilities through which we can easily navigate without touching everything um, that we need to, because for example, here, there is a reaction unlikely that's forbidden, or we have certain other filters that we can actually use and, and um, take care of while we generate the results on the fly navigating through this hypercube. To describe molecules, we need a descriptor. That's what the information scientists call it. Our descriptor is a so-called feature tree. I will not go into details here, but I'm happy to in the Q&A, of course, if, if you'd like to know more. Um, so essentially, we split this up into baby trees, and these baby trees ask the chemical space, find me something which is similar. For example, this baby tree here is, um, is retrieved from this baby tree and it also has a linker knows what reactions it can undergo we retrieve the next one from the chemical space and then ask okay so we have this we have this um what is most similar to this and then we get the final result and this is the um the reassembled molecule that actually knows about its anamnesis so we can go back and tell the user this um, is the order number and this can be made in such and such a way for example Okay, so a few applications, um, SAR by space. Uh, that works beautifully. We've seen this now in multiple projects and I pick out one um, that we actually recently published. Uh, this has, has been uh, mostly done by Franka Klingler, whom I had on the very, very first slide, just as well as kind of a co-author for this talk because Franka has uh, invested a lot of time and work into these projects. Um, very regrettably, she has moved on forward and is now with uh, MSD in um, in England. But uh, we still have a very, very good vibrations and she closely follows what we are doing. So SAR by space, how does this work? Well, essentially the idea is I have just a little something. I have something which seems to be active. Uh, for example, that's one use case. Or the other one is I have already something really good, but I need to escape that. I would like to find alternatives for this. I would like to explore the the SAR around this compound using the chemical space that I have at hand. So the exercise that we did here was we used 14 known actives, but actives is again in high comma uh, to make clear that these weren't really uh, very active. It was at the edge of activity. There was some something in there that emerged the noise, I should say, that was taken from this uh, bio medchem publication two years ago. And uh, we had these query molecules and with these query molecules, we went and asked the chemical space, uh, notably uh, enamine real uh, in one of the earlier versions there, what are the 5,000 most similar compounds that you can deliver back to me given this query? And we did this for every of these four queries here and came back with various hits. And these hits um, you see are kind of surprising for the chemists because the feature trees descriptor that I mentioned before is kind of a fuzzy descriptor. It is not very exact. And that's the good news about it because you would like to have something different. You don't want your query back exactly as it is, but you would like to have new ideas. So you see that the Tanimoto classical similarity that, that has been used here to also co-display this in the table is comparably low, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3. But the F3 similarity is comparably high, 0 0.95, 92, 93, 95, 93. And that's often, uh, uh, often attractive. I'll have something like this on later slides as well. A high pitch tree similarity, a lower tiny motor similarity, that's what usually surprises the chemist, yet is still chemically in the, in the same ballpark. 
and, um, and we measured uh, thermal shifts um, and came out with a bunch of um, yeah thermal shifts that 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 um, that were obvious in the experiments and um, did follow up IC50 experiments and uh, found a few comparably low micromolar actives. So they are not super duper active, but what's stunning about all this, it's uh, SAR by space. So it's essentially just a quick exploration of the SAR around, the, uh, around these uh, molecules. What is stunning is the time frame under which this was done. So the experts amongst you have already recognized that this has been poured into a NIME workflow. For the, for the non-experts amongst you, NIME is a great um, environment that is free to download from NIME.org. NIME is spelled K-N-I-M-E.org. And you can set up your own workflows there and use our tools and algorithms in there. And then essentially once everything is set up, you press a button and you start from here and this pipeline works. So the design was really done within less than a week, a few days only. The synthesis, stunning, uh, stunningly uh, quick, was done by in, I mean, in less than three weeks, and the testing took another two weeks. So it was less than three weeks from a simple query that wasn't even very active to five times something in the lower micromolar region. And that was really uh, very comforting. And we're not the only ones. Also Merck in uh, Darmstadt in Germany, they reported about this uh, during their Curious 2018 U Jubilee uh, conference, and they call their chemical space massive, massive, and massive, and it's um, 10 to the 20th virtual molecules. They applied this throughout 12 drug discovery projects back then. Per experiment, four to 60 compounds, and they came back with more than 80% feasibility. They had higher speeds, so they accelerated the projects by two times across these 12. But look at this figure. This is what I really find amazing, 10 times cheaper. So they drastically reduced the cost, um, which is really uh, great for them, but also great for us, IP by design, because the spaces are just so huge. So what we hear often is, so is bigger really better? So do I really have to make these huge spaces? Will I really find it? Does it really help making the haystack even larger? And um, there are a few indications here why we think this is very, very true, that you should definitely make and increase the haystack larger. So here is a slide from the NIH workshop um, that I shamelessly stole from Jenny Elward, who was reporting about novelty. So they um, spun up a um, their series of actives into uh, two principal components and what you see is in black they you sh you see what they had already and in pinkish or fuchsia or yeah more pink than fuchsia you see the enamine series a compound so the compounds that they were retrieving using this technology and they scatter all over the place so they are very distant actually from there from there and um, obviously they were very happy with what they saw um, another indicator is um, when you make these spaces bigger and when you even add other spaces, the, the overlap of spaces is, uh, that's also something that we saw in a, in a recent paper that Böhringer Ingelheim have written up. Uh, so if you Google for Uta Lessel, L-E-S-S-E-L, -S -S -E she was also talking last week at the NIH. When you Google for, for her name, you will see a recent publication, I think it's a 2000. 19 publication as well. Um, there we invest, investigated the chemical space overlap and you see something very similar here from Johnson & Johnson. So in yellow we see the Wuxi galaxy space which occupies distinct, distinct spaces here in these principal component uh, displays. Uh, in blue you see the Johnson & Johnson chemical space, so the big 10 to the 19th space. In green we see enamine real. Look how different they are. And in red, we see the uh, publicly available uh, synthons driven chemical space called knowledge space that you can download from our web page. This obviously does have certain overlap with the Johnson & Johnson space as well, but there are still, even there, there are distinct regions. And to me, in the end, the question isn't really how big is the space, um, make it just as big as you can. Uh, the important question is, can you actually find the needle in that haystack? And this, um, this is actually something which we can do, and we can prove that. 
comprehensiveness, something um, which is out in the public for you to review if you'd like. So um, we were very happy to have AstraZeneca um, as a guest speaker in our webinar series at BioSovity. So here's the link. It was given in 2018 uh, by Christoph Grebner. And what they did is they, um, they created a 10 to the 15th virtual molecules chemical space and then they used a subset to assess the question will I find something new the larger I can make the space and indeed what they saw is and look at the scale here we have 10 to the fifth here and 10 to the tenth there and the space is five orders of magnitude larger so even 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 larger so they just looked at um, uh, 0 .1, 0 0.001 percent of the entire space that they created but what we seem to see is a convergence with the number of scaffolds that is comprehensive com comprehensible so we can understand that because of course the number of building blocks themselves is limited in the spaces but if we reassemble them to novel molecules the number of hits and it's displayed uh, in a double logarithmic way here so the, if you if you increase this, the space by an order of magnitude, you also have a higher likelihood of finding an order of magnitude more actives in there. So that was a very interesting webinar. Actually, I can I can really highly recommend this. Ten to the fifteenth compared to ten to the tenth here, it's simply not possible to enumerate a ten to the fifteenth chemical space as you've seen with the associated costs and times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, on one of the earlier slides. So here is the, uh, the the question, do fisheries find the needle? We have done numerous experiments there as well, and it's also clear from the algorithmic setup that fisheries is able to find that needle in the haystack. But um, it's still good to see um, this in other people's hands and reassess this. So um, here we have in blue the retrieval rate of feature trees with respect to the big set. So the 10 to the 15 set, so it's a little bit comparing apples and pears here because Fast Rocks uh, was operated on a 10 to the 8 subset of these spaces. But feature trees have this navigation through the Hypercube technology, which, which is called dynamic programming for the um, IT experts amongst you. And it, it guarantees to find the best possible active um, or the, the, the closest uh, similar one given, um, given that space with an epsilon that there is that we understand because we have to take care of uh, the on the fly alternative uh, possibilities, et cetera. And also please note that some molecules couldn't be retrieved again by feature trees nor by, by uh, rocks and fast rocks because they were excluded uh, from the databases um, for various filters and restrictions or if they failed to have proper conformat generation be done. So these can still result as a query. In other words, we have a query that can perhaps not find something back because it's simply not in there. But I mean, that's 98%, 94, 96, 96%. That's fairly, fairly close to actually um, guaranteed finding the needle in the haystack. But yeah, so is F3 the best then? Um, is this the method that everybody should use or so? Well, feature trees is blind when it comes to stereochemistry and substitution patterns. Feature trees cannot distinguish between automata and para, which means that it's great to actually augment this blindness to compensate this blindness with other method methods. So shape is the obvious thing because feature trees is also not capturing shape as such. There are radii in there, but it's not really shape. And uh, stereochemistry will often have drastic effects on shape. So AstraZeneca say um, feature trees and rocks complement each other. So use them both. First feature trees to generate a few million or whatever you like um, results and then post-process these with a shape-aware method, for example, rocks. Also a great orthogonal view is classical Tani Tanimoto. We had this before already a little bit, but GSK say, um, now look at this, uh, it's very tiny. So feature tree similarity on the x-axis goes from here to one, from zero to one. And here we have the Tanimoto similarities. So it's kind of Tanimoto versus similarity, high Tanimoto up here in the Northwest. What's interesting to see is that there are, and we have seen this with many other clients as well. What's interesting to see is that there are low Tanimoto actives that have high feature tree similarities. So these are the distinct scaffold hops that you would like to see. So it's definitely worthwhile to look at things with uh, diff two different operators. And also um, when there is um, low feature tree similarity here, 
but higher Tanimoto, there are still a few that can be captured there. So it's kind of throwing out the net far, far away. I think John Irvin used this in the NIH conference during the NIH conference. Uh, we'd like to throw out our, our fish net far, far away, and then you can collect close by. So that's essentially the idea. And also, uh, Böhringer, I have seen something similar, which is published in a paper by Valenzon et al. in this uh, in this uh, publication here. Okay, so now that I have acquainted you with the philosophy, with the thinking, how this all works, we can take it out into 3D, chemical space docking. That's, of course, way, way harder because now we, have, we are in three dimensions. And um, so the principle still holds. So instead of just navigating through the hypercube of possibilities using feature trees, now we navigate through the hypercube of possibilities in a pocket. How can we do this? Well, the fragment space is essentially just the same, except that now these uh, these fragments in that space, and we are talking about, I don't know, maybe 150,000 almost um, when we talk about enemy real space. So we have the assembly of 150,000 fragments in there. So we are talking about docking 150,000 fragments initially and recording their reaction fate, I should say, or what they, what they can do um, with these linker atoms here, link, links. But of course, uh, there will be issues when we, when we actually do this. And some of them I already tried to uh, depict here. So if we do this in an automatic fashion, then we would like to avoid unwanted linker positions. So here's an example. Um, sorry, here is actually uh, an example. Yeah, where the linker slams into the wall. This is something that we do not want. Um, we can control these things with a certain pharmacophore for special linkers. So we could, in principle, put like a pharmacophore um, belt around the around the uh, active site here to exclude that linker. Um, atoms come close to a region where there would be no chance of actually continuing uh, with the grow up in the pocket and could just exclude these right from the start. And it has been proven to actually be a good thing to be very strict on filtering early on with respect to these fragments. And um, then we can work not only with uh, certain, uh, how should I say, excluding uh, functions, uh, special pharmacophores, but we can also use functional groups that we'd like to see or not to see certain areas. And um, we can also rule out things that just go to the rim of the pocket, etc. Exclusion volumes, essentially what you can use there. So we rule those out and one of those survives. And now the question is, how can we just um, continue uh, to work with, with these things? In principle, we could pick the next uh, chunk of compatible reagents from the chemical space, connect them, explore the rotational degrees of freedom. This is currently not yet feasible. So that we are not yet quite there. So currently what we have to do is we have to to go back and do the dirty job of enumerating something, but we only have to do enumeration of a sub library part of a sub part of the library now, namely only those that are compatible to this green Lego brick here. And this is only a fraction of what, what is possible in total. And then we would be left with a list of molecules that are actually compliant with this green Lego brick. And we would have to dock these uh, assembled molecules. But then again, we are left with the problem, how should we do this? Because then I would have to talk the entire molecule from the beginning. This is not something uh, what we want to do because we already have the knowledge of this very fragment being present here. So we can use this in something that we call template-based docking. So here we have our compatibility matrix, as we've seen before in the feature trees-based uh, approaches. We see that green is compatible with yellow and green is also compatible with red. So you see this here and there. So we only have to enumerate those um, molecules that would be or that, that we could assemble using a connection with yellow and with red here, which makes a comparably small list in the end. And then we can dock these in a template-based fashion. That means that the full molecule is analyzed and it's looked what is the most common similar substructure, and then we align this similar substructure to this. Um, to this fragment here and then we have a way forward we only need to optimize the rest of the torsional space which um, is easily uh, doable on uh, on computers that we have a standard standard hardware 
So the first fragments that we dock here, let me call them base fragments or first order fragments. We use them as kind of an anchor and grow procedure to build this up according to the reaction compatibilities. So placement and filtering again, we do this here, the, um, this stays fixed. And then um, we actually, when we add the next thing, we must make sure that here we do not run against the wall, but this is integrated in our docking algorithm. So there is class checks that we can use. They are fast enough, that's all fine. And then one by one by one, um, we build up the final molecules here. This is how it works. So massive filtering on the fly, uh, respect of the reactions underneath, and then eyeballing to extract the top of the list. Looking at the entire workflow here, it works as such. We have a preparation of the uh, data input. So first off, certainly uh, wisely choose the crystal structure of your choice. Um, look at the electron density. If you cannot look at the electron density, perhaps try to find the person who actually recorded the, uh, the crystal structure and uh, find out where there may be weaknesses, where they could not resolve density, where there were other issues. Um, is there an artifact that you need to consider uh, by creating the uh, symmetry, um, the symmetry pair, and so on and so forth? Uh, perhaps determine useful pharmacophore constraints. Then dock your first order fragments. So the, all the fragments of the chemical space will be docked, and use again filtering as you can visual selection of the best candidates. And then comes the expensive part, the library sub enumeration. You see how the data goes up here. So the higher these bars, the more data we have in the process. We need to expand this um, and then do the template-based docking and filtering, which shrinks the data set again, and then do cherry picking with visual inspection. This is how this in principle would work. And we are working on a shortcut here because we don't like this. We don't like to, to be forced to do an enumeration that in principle wouldn't be necessary, but that's uh, hard coding and will still need a little bit of time. Challenges and solutions along the way. Well, the link up position here is an example. This one slams into the wall. I have already explained what one can do then in, in these uh, contexts. But also, you, we, we have seen quite a scattering with respect to the sizes of the uh, first order fragments that we employ. And something which is very nice and easy to use is the hide scoring function that we've been developing with Bayer during the last 15 years. It's a desolvation aware scoring system that gives us help in assessing um, what might um, actually bind with a proper free energy. And this applies also to the fragments. So that means that we can employ ligand efficiency or lipophilic ligand efficiency if we even wanted to as a filter criterion, which gives us an estimate for, okay, should we keep something with a molecular weight of 200 if the ligand efficiency is not super good? Or should we perhaps even take a, long, a larger one into account that has a, a good ligand efficiency as well. So these are things that we can use along the, the, the way while we build up with the final molecules in the pockets. Then we have this vast size of the enumerated sub-library. So I'm currently presenting here from my, uh, my MacBook, um, which has uh, eight CPUs, which is already quite, quite a number of CPUs, but certainly for these larger tasks, it would be wishful to not only operate on a laptop or on a stand desktop, but perhaps to, to, to do something more. So um, uh, we, uh, we are using servers, um, in-house servers that help us a little bit do these things faster. There are REST APIs that we can exploit from and this, you know, exports the work to something larger. Recent chemical space applications, a brief, brief overview here. So we have uh, and ha have had or are still having some ongoing collaboration with 11 customers, seven of which belong to the top 10 pharma companies, creation of seven customer spaces I've used, as you've seen on the previous slides with these planets, etc. We search in spaces for 12 different targets so far. And um, we had especially one roaring success uh, where we very, very rapidly arrived at low nanomolar binders after chemical space docking. I cannot regrettably disclose who this was, but we still hope to be able to publish with this partner in uh, 2021. Um, in German, we'd say the Hoffnung stirbt zuletzt. So hope uh, dies um, in the end only if it dies. But uh, perhaps we can actually publish this and then uh, I'd be happy to share this. Um, and most of the results are protected by NDAs. However, I can, um, I can show you one thing, namely uh, the hunt for uh, active binders in the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. 
a binding growth. The starting point there that we used was seven reversible fragments from x -cam structures, x from X-rays, and um, you see how they cluster more or less in the center of this binding growth here. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to explore this pocket rapidly with uh, chemical space docking and um, and hoping we were hoping to actually find some actives here. So what we what did we do? Uh, we did exactly what I showed you before. We docked all the real space building blocks. So we are talking again billions now um, of enumerated molecules that we do not enumerate but uh, we assemble on the fly. We selected the best 100 binding fragments and then we did this enumeration uh, of the subspace that uh, was 1.7 million so that's still doable and then we requested uh, a number of poses per docking and this is why we came up with a higher number namely 2.3 poses here inspected the best 50,000 visually and used our filters in CSAR and then eyeballed things and selected 13 candidates that were made and delivered all came back by the way and here are these candidates and um, and a bunch of them was actually moderately active, so uh, not not very not very active, but a little bit active. And I wanted to pick one which is really exotic out here. So it has uh, three stereo centers, uh, as you can see, and it's also perhaps not the most uh, sexy molecule on the planet when it comes to something that shall serve as a lead. So, um, but what I wanted to make sure is because it's so exotic it's especially stunning that we can pick this from such a huge space of possibilities and it was synthesized it was delivered and it has been measured and um and it comes back actually with an order number and this is this is pretty amazing yeah so choose from billions run this and within a very short amount of time you get back a proposal that proposes a binding mode and comes back with an order number. So this copy and paste sent it over to Enamin uh, analogously with a Wuxi order number and get it delivered to your bench in, in a very rapid, rapid time frame. So this is uh, remarkable. And um, here comes the summary, summary and availability for the current methods. So chemical spaces can be searched entirely using the Infinities and Features technology. You could do a subset enumeration and then continue to work with your own favorite methods that you have beyond this. But you could just as well um, hunt for a chemical space docking and explore the vast spaces using 3D information. It does lead to synthesizable and purchasable compounds. That's what we've seen now. And I hope I could make this plausible, even though the time is too early to actually show you a bunch of working examples from academia or from companies. And the question is, how can I get it? Well, we need a little bit more patience from you. Uh, you it's not yet a software product. We are working on this, but uh, our discovery services department will be happy to actually assist you there and do this for you for the time being. Just get into touch with us, please. That said, brief outlook. Upcoming is something uh, which has already created quite a wave on uh, LinkedIn and here in our email boxes, something that Matthias Rareis group actually created in Hamburg, in, the, in one of the beautiful, most beautiful cities in Germany, I have to admit. So uh, Louis Bellman is first author of this paper that just appeared in JSIM. If you want to give it a read, um, it explains all about the descriptors that he uses there. And what this does, this space light system is, it uses classical Tanimoto searching, but across these reaction driven chemical spaces. So you can use this with 10 to the 20th and still get results in, in no time. It's, it's super fast. So 10 to the 15th, they search in just a few seconds on standard hardware. So on my laptop, it would just run like this. Uh, again, I mentioned this. Why, why do we think that this is a useful tool? Well, because we do not only want to jump far, but we want also to be able to uh, or be able to collect the close by nearest neighbors using then space light. That's what it's taught, called. Here's the publication. And the other thing uh, that have uh, where we have been starting to implement this and integrate it and rewrite it to uh, make it fully compliant with our and compatible with our code base is called fast grow that was a beautiful and still is a beautiful project that we are currently entertaining with uh, the hamburgers with matthias's group patrick penner is first author of the publication that again came out only a few weeks ago and servier 
is the pharma company in Paris that is actually also on board in this in this triangle. So I'm much looking forward to these two new building blocks um, software-wise in the chemical space navigation. I'm pretty convinced that this will give added value to all of you if you'd like to take a look. With this, um, I'm closing. Thank you to all our space collaborators, uh, notably Yuri from ChemSpace and uh, half, half a leg, as we'd say in German, is also with an Inamin, if I understand this. The uh, Wushi Lab Network, Pfizer, Beringer, Evotech, Astra, Johnson Johnson, AbbVie, the Merck Group, GSK, Sergi, and Jean-Louis Raymond, um, whom I didn't mention in, in his collaboration with us, but Jean-Louis is also extremely cooperative and helpful when it comes to re-scaffolding databases that we also use, but I did not want to talk about this today. That wasn't the topic of today. And most uh, certainly, Matthias Rarey's lab in Hamburg, Matthias is um, one of the co-founders of BioServity, so um, we feel very happy and honored to have him on board with these um, state-of-the-art state technologies that his lab contributes. And my final mention goes to the Chemical Space Club that has been funded last week at the NIH conference. It's a LinkedIn network of professionals to discuss and learn things about chemical spaces and large databases, exchange ideas. And we are already spinning a little bit in our brains how to organize uh, perhaps a meeting um, from within the Chemical Space Club. It has so rapidly grown and we, we are already 190 plus 190 members in there. So if you'd like to join in, feel free to. It's currently admi administered by um, by BASF as one of the uh, industry partners, by uh, Mark Niklaus, who joined in as the academic part, and by ourselves, so uh, that we have a triangle perspective from all different areas there. Uh, okay, with this, I should stop here. Thank you very much. I hope I was clear enough. You could understand things. And Yuri, um, I hand back the microphone over to you then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, thank you for the, such a nice uh, presentation. Now we have uh, time for questions. And uh, since we don't have, uh, just I think we, uh, uh, I have one question uh, while we're waiting for others. So uh, how, how fast is this, you know, chemical space uh, docking uh, using, you know, the fragment approach? Uh, I mean, how long does it take, you know, from from target selection to basically submission uh, hits for synthesis? Yeah, so it certainly depends on the hardware. We do not have uh, such a supercomputer. Also, in the in the company, we have a cluster um, with um, several dozens of nodes, and then usually this is done within several days. Let's say then uh, target selection is something that we usually. Uh, put back to the client's desk. We assist there, certainly, if if the client does not know where there could be a binding site, an allosteric pocket, etc. We are happy to help, but usually the clients come with relatively clear um, uh, a clear views on their own target situation, and then it means that we would have to do the docking, and the docking itself runs usually a few days, as mentioned, and then eyeballing. Um, so, let's say, perhaps in total two to three weeks on an average um, uh, target with with the standard scenario and then you can submit it you know yeah. thank you uh, can you work do you need to have a whole target or you can work with this binding pocket prepared in a special way yeah, um, so our code base um, takes care of protonation, tautomers, and uh, and these things automatically. And it does this per pose, actually, even. So it could be that a lysin uh, N3H, uh, NH3 pro propeller turns around a little bit from pose to pose, and this is what we take into account. So if you have more than just the binding site, it would be better for us um, in terms of the chemistry. It would probably be a little bit more comprehensive and we'd be a little bit more on the safer side. If you do not have this, then we would um, try to take a look and assess the size of, of, the, of the cavity and probably also would be able to work with this. Another thing that I didn't detail, what we could do is um, the hamburgers have something nice up on their proteins.plus. That's actually the website, proteins.plus. You can navigate there on their proteins.plus web server. Uh, which is called Siena, which can mine given a binding site from the PDB similar binding sites 
Um, so from there you can perhaps learn what other proteins might be very related to the to the binding site that you currently have at, at hand. Thank you. And, uh, uh, can you please say more uh, how target selection works? Okay. Um, well, target selection is usually um, on the is done by the clients that we have, uh, but um, certainly we can help with this. So we have um, possibilities to compute the binding sites, and uh, we also have a means to assess um, certain druggability of binding sites that we use. And if we're in doubt with respect to various um, binding sites, then we can be guided by these things. <clears throat> Other than that, usually I'm a pronounced friend of actually looking at things. So, for example, for the SARS, uh, SARS-CoV protease um, in CSA, that's our 3D uh, tool that everybody can use and download um, and test for free for a few days from our website. Um, we have a facility where you can slide um, an RMSD value a little bit further up to see where there are differences in the proteins, in the in actually the amino acids on an atomic level, so that you dim out the view and only those remain that are really different uh, with respect to a given RMSD Armstrong value. Um, and this is of great help. So I did a lot of eyeballing there when I selected what, what PDB structure I actually uh, wanted to go with further on. Not so sure whether I have Fully answered the question, but I hope so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for this uh, very interesting session. How could such spaces be used in a ligand-based fashion? Uh, as examples, were structure-based driven application of ML yeah. models to such spaces. Uh, yeah, that's a question. For when no structured data is available. Um, so when, when I read ligand based, then probably this alludes to 3D ligand based. Yeah. So um, let me see. How could such spaces be used in a ligand based fashion? As examples, were structure based driven. But the first examples that I gave, they were not structure driven. So there we did have no protein information, and notably, for example, this valent zone paper. You can perhaps quickly pop this up. Let me see. Uh, I should be able to search and find here, just a second. There it is. So here is Bernd Wellenzohn's paper from Böhringer Ingelheim. What they did here is essentially depicted here already on this on this larger and this larger cutout on this teaser here. So they did not have any structural information. They only had the ligands and they used various queries that they have. So the a few actives, that was the starting point. And then they searched against their so-called BI claim chemical space. And here comes the essential part. After they had certain lists of solutions from feature trees, so from picking out these fragment spaces, they augmented this by filtering or augmenting, augmented the information using shape information that they use with rocks. So they post-filtered, merging the results generated rocks overlaps with those queries, and then did filtering and came up with uh, novel hit classes there. So this is um, non-structure based, it was ligand based, but I assume that the question is a little bit more, how could we exploit the combinatorial uh, chemistry in also searching um, ligand based? So that means in searching in a combinatorial superposition based way. Um, this is something that we cannot do today, uh, but we have a plan how to do this. So we know how to how to go forward there. Um, and it's, I should say, it's at the horizon um, of, of being uh, started. Um, so give us a little bit more the time and uh, hopefully we'll be able to present something to you in the forthcoming years. Uh, I'm not so sure whether the question again was answered uh, successfully, but I do hope so. If not, please ask again. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I think uh, with that, I would like to uh, probably, you know, finish and uh, conclude. And th thanks. Thank you again, Marcus, for um, joining uh, us today and actually, uh, yeah, just making this really, really great presentation. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to see uh, everything implemented as, as you've done with CSAR. Uh, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, we'll have uh, the recording of the meet of the webinar available and we'll share it with all the attendees 
as well as the registered uh, users. So for those who are not, not who weren't able to to join us today, and uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, please send. The, please feel free to contact uh, myself or Marcos. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I should. Should I've written my email down here, but it's just Marcos with a C at biosolit.com and you will find me. Yuri, thank you so much and thank you everybody in the audience. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.